On the day that Troy Davis was executed, I was at St. Mary's Church in Harlem and heard Yusuf Salam recite the poem, The Revolution Will Not Be Televised, and I wept, knowing how he had lost his childhood and suspecting that Troy's life would not be spared. I prayed for the members of the Supreme Court, for the President, for those who had the power to stop the execution. But my prayers were ignored. That day was a turning point for me, a day when I recognized that my life needed to be dedicated to preventing these things from happening, and that research would be the means to that end. Yusuf Salam, Anton McRae, Kevin Richardson, Raymond Santana, Carrie Wise. Once teenage boys at the wrong place at the wrong time, hunted down by the NYPD in order to name a suspect in a brutal rape case that overshadowed all other rape cases in New York City in 1989. The Central Park jogger, Trisha Miley, was a white woman and an investment banker. The prosecutors rounded up boys from Harlem, black and brown boys. Four of them were coerced into making false confessions and into implicating each other. A fifth never made a confession, but was convicted based on the statements of the other four. The all later recanted their statements, claiming they were coerced, but were convicted by a jury. Two of the boys were 14, two were 15, and one who was 16 was tried as an adult. The boys convicted of the rape of Trisha Miley received legal protection that was, as stated in Kent versus the United States, the worst of both worlds. Neither the protection accorded to adults nor the solicitous care and regenerative treatment postulated for children. The legal notion of parents patriae, the state as parent, was meant to provide protection to young people. However, it had the opposite effect. In legal cases in the 1960s, Kent versus the United States and in Galt, ruled for the first time that juveniles had 14th Amendment rights, the right to notice and counsel, the right to question witnesses, and to protection against self-incrimination. These rulings struck down the murky paternalistic notion of parents patriae in favor of clear legal guidelines. However, the history of the legal precedent of parents patriae cast a shadow on our juvenile justice system, leaving these five boys at the mercy of a prosecution team who wasn't a kind and just parent, but an abusive and deceitful state seeking a conviction rather than justice. In spite of being read their Miranda rights, the Central Park Five implicated themselves and didn't receive adequate protection. The coerced confessions and the youth's self-incrimination amounts to what Brotherton referred to as a theater of cruelty, a trap constructed by the prosecution to make a case against themselves. As one of the five stated, they're using my words against me. So what does that tell us about justice? Thinking about Deutsch's model of value-based justice, young people should be identified as being in need of resources to protect themselves as a vulnerable population but their protection wasn't a priority. According to Bernadine Dorn, the standard of justice that should be implemented in all legal cases concerning young people is to ask oneself, what would I do if this were my child? This question does not let the person off the hook, but forces the implementation of moral inclusion. In other words, believing consideration of fairness to apply to another, being willing to allocate a share in community resources to another, and being willing to make sacrifices to foster another's well-being. The third point, ensuring another's well-being, is generally overlooked as a principle of justice in our system of law and order. It is also overlooked in the juvenile justice system. For example, Bill Ayers describes the Chicago juvenile courts as being so overcrowded and under-resourced as to allow an average of 12 minutes for each case that is seen before a judge. For those who are sentenced to juvenile detention or adult prison, that allocation of attention constitutes moral exclusion and is an inadequate amount of time to address losing one's freedom. Once convicted, the five were not paroled early because they maintained their innocence rather than admitting contrition and ended up serving the maximum sentence. Their protest of injustice extended the period of punishment. A documentary film about the Central Park Five was released in 2012. Just as museums documenting the Holocaust create a public memory of how atrocities happened as a way of ensuring they aren't repeated, 
This film stands as a warning about the miscarriage of justice. Ironically, the state being sued by three of the Central Park Five for wrongful prosecution has subpoenaed the interviews conducted by the documentarians. This serves as a warning to me as a researcher about knowing what legal protections I can offer people in my studies and what information shouldn't be collected. Finally, there's a question of what gets defined as a crime. In the Central Park Five case, the prosecution used false testimony to convict five minors, but they haven't been prosecuted for any crime or wrongdoing. This raises the question of who gets classified as a criminal and who gets away with crimes.